Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you for attending our virtual uh, speaker series event. So this is Brother uh, Stigminjing. So I joined American uh, ACMS um, a little over a month ago as the executive or, uh, director. So some of you may be first time um, here. So let me briefly introduce you our organization. So I will share my screen. Okay, so American Center for Mongolian Studies um, was established in 2002. So also for short is SMS. So SMS is a nonprofit educational organization that works to strengthen and deepen academic and cultural connections between United States and Mongolia. So our UB office established in 2004. So currently it's, uh, it is located in UB library. So we have um, a library. So our library has over 5,000 um, books uh, that covers uh, Mongolian studies and other disciplines of uh, sciences. So um, we do, um, uh, virtual speaker series event uh, every month. Actually, uh, we uh, usually do this event actually in person twice a month uh, because of COVID-19 uh, pandemic related. We are not able to do our uh, in-person events since January. So some of you probably know that uh, our virtual speaker series started in April. Um, so also, we have monthly uh, newsletter. Um, if you are a member, um, uh, if you have your, um, you know, if you've been uh, attended our events, you're probably getting our newsletter monthly basis. And also, we have different fellowships to support graduate students, um, you know, scholars and scientists. Um, so if you go to our website, you can see uh, different options. And also we do have support services like uh, scientists who are coming from the States to Mongolia to do research. We provide all kinds of different services to help them out to have their um, uh, research in Mongolia successfully done. And also we do um, cultural exchange and academic exchange between US and Mongolia. We do have Mongolian language programs. And also currently we have a texture uh, conservation project uh, to do with cultural uh, heritage. And we got this grant uh, from uh, US Embassy, it's Ambassador's Fund. So please go to our website, uh, get more detailed information about uh, our organization. So also we have a, um, um, you know, we are member-based organization, so we have individual uh, membership option, also institutional membership. Uh, so please go to this um, uh, website link and uh, please become a member. And so also, you know, you go to our website, um, donate if you can. Uh, so your donation, membership dues, supports our fellowship, um, our uh, fellowship and you know different uh, events like today's event. Um, so please um, go to our website and do your donations. Um, so also we have different. Um, we use different social uh, media platforms. You can see our address here, and please follow us. You will be updated events. Um, that we're doing. Um, so you will be updated about uh, all that information through social media too. So um, I'm really excited about actually today's uh, special speaker series topic. And so I do have my uh, own connections uh, uh, related to today's topic. I just want to share that with you all. So my uh, great uncle, um, but that Dimchik, also his known is John Dimchikov. He was the science representative from Mongolian government for Central Asiatic Expedition in 1920s. Um, 
And so he, he was one of founders of archaeology uh, in Mongolia. Um, so in terms of myself, I'm actually a paleontologist and my graduate research study was based in an American Museum of Natural History. And so I joined um, current expedition um, uh, with my father who was a paleontologist uh, in 19, um, 90s, mid 1990s. Uh, so these expeditions are actually led by uh, Mike Novacek and Mark Norell, uh, who are um, actually here in our panel. And also my colleagues, they were my graduate, um, um, you know, committee members and uh, advisors when I was in graduate school. So I can't wait to learn more about uh, Central Asiatic Expedition from our uh, panel speakers today. So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce you to moderator of our today's uh, speaker series, uh, Dr. Marisa Smith. Um, Dr. Smith is a Mongolia expert who has conducted extensive research in the country and has written a wide range of contemporary Mongolian issues, including politics, sovereignty, labor, contemporary socialism, mobile pastoralism, international cooperation and relations between Russians and Mongolians. She completed her PhD in anthropology at the Princeton uh, University in 2015 and has taught um, anthropology and world history and conducted training during extended field research trips in remote areas of Mongolia. She is currently affiliated with Central Asia Working Group, UC Berkeley's Institute of East Asian Studies, and sits on the governing board of American Center for Mongolian Studies. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Smith. And so you have the stage, well, virtual stage. Thank you. Marisa, are you here? Hi, everyone. Just needed to be unmuted there. Um, thank you, Dr. Minjin. Um, I'm also really excited about this panel. Um, I've had the opportunity to travel to Bayanzag, and I am a, an alumnus of this alumna of the same college that Roy Chapman Andrews attended in his hometown of Beloit, Wisconsin. Um, so it's nothing like um, Dr. Minjin's connection, but um, I'm nonetheless very excited. Um, okay, so we have several speakers for you. Um, I will introduce each person more extensively before they give their presentation. Um, before we start, I wanted to just remind everyone um, that if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and Natsu and I will be collecting them and we will be presenting them at the end. So there will be some discussion. Um, okay, so our first presenter is Anne Bossom, rhymes with awesome. Uh, she is going to be talking a bit about Roy Chapman Andrews um, a bit more holistically as a person. Uh, she is writing from Beloit, Wisconsin, which I just mentioned is his uh, hometown. Um, and she writes books for readers of all ages. And her, besides Roy Chapman Andrews, she's also written about social justice issues from American history, including voting rights for women, the civil rights movement of the American South, free speech, immigration, and queer, queer history. Um, her books appear frequently on lists of recommended and notable titles and have earned numerous awards. And in 2017, uh, she was honored with the Children's Book Guild, Washington, Book Guild of Washington, D.C.'s award um, for nonfiction. And I will turn it over to her. Thanks, Marissa. And it's, um, a, there's definitely a quota of Beloit people and Beloit connections here. And uh, I'm an alum as well. And that's what helped to bring me to Roy Chapman Andrews. And I was asked to do a little bit of uh, background for everyone. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm also going to talk a bit about the legacy of Andrews in his hometown of Beloit. And um, so I'm going to switch to uh, screen share and, um, and begin with that and, uh, and introduce you to a side of Roy you may not know, uh, but this is a look at his childhood 
and the beginnings of it in Beloit, Wisconsin. He was born January 26th, 1884 uh, in this house that is still standing. And um, here's a picture of him when he was uh, turning eight years old. And like many children, uh, boys of that era, especially uh, a year later when he turned nine, he received as a birthday present his first shotgun. And that uh, helped to catapult him towards the world of, um, of being a naturalist and, um, and an explorer. And he, I have a few quotes that I'll share as I go along. And one of the early ones was, uh, I was like a rabbit as a child, happily, happy only when I could run out of doors. To stay in the house was torture to me then, and it has been ever since. And Andrews um, uh, brought that love of adventure with him to the Gobi. You're gonna hear a lot more about that. But he also brought one other thing with him from his hometown. And I would just like to point out that when he was eight, someone gave him a really good lesson of how to stand when um, you're having your portrait taken. And he, he kept that knowledge with him for the duration. So uh, Andrews chose, as you've heard, to go to Beloit College. And uh, while he was a student there, he was not necessarily the best student, but he definitely uh, was engaged in the campus life. Uh, here he is on um, an inner squad baseball team. And he also did uh, continue to do the kinds of explorations in the area that he had done throughout his childhood. And one of the people he liked to explore with was an English professor named Montague White. And in uh, 1905, when Andrews was a year away from completing college, the two of them went on a boating trip in their spring break. And it ended very badly, um, for Montague White anyway, who ended up drowning when their canoe overturned. And uh, I'm not the only person who would suggest that this helped to guide Andrews later on as an expedition leader when it came to safety and uh, making sure that he had thought through the potential risks that other people could be facing and he could face in the field. Uh, and Andrews commented later, it seems so, so strange that Monty, the good swimmer, was the one to die almost within reach of safety while I survived against well nigh impossible odds. Still, it happened that way several times in my life, which is a gross understatement for anybody who's familiar with the um, all of the adventures that Andrews packed into his lifetime. So uh, in uh, 1906, Andrews finished college. He headed for New York almost immediately. It had been a, um, a, a dream for, for most of his, um, his life to work at the American Museum. And he managed to talk his way into the office of the director uh, of the American Museum uh, showed up and, and said to Herman C. Bumpus that he would like a job, thank you very much. Uh, and, um, and Herman Bumpus said, well, I don't have any jobs for you. And Andrews apparently replied, I just wanna work here. You have to have someone to clean the floors. Couldn't I do that? To which Dr. Bumpus replied, but a man with a college education doesn't want to clean floors. And Andrews famously said, no, not just any floors but the museum floors are different. I'll clean them and love it if you'll let me. And that earned him his starting job at the American Museum. Uh, legend has it that he did have a mop in hand or a broom, but he also was put to work almost immediately. And here he is helping to build a model of a sulfur bottomed whale. Um, later that year, he was in the field for the first time out on Long Island, um, tasked with bringing out the, the bones from uh, a right whale that had been beached on the shores, which was kind of an impossible assignment at the time, but also uh, a remarkable one because whale skeletons had not been fully understood at that time. And uh, Andrews and his colleague succeeded and that helped to put him further into the field. And when he went into the field, he took a camera with him. He thought it was important to be able to document uh, his expeditions. And in 1908, he was already using that camera, taking some of the first ever live action pictures of whales. Uh, in 1909, he visited the South Pacific for the first time as uh, uh, representing the American Museum on the USS Albatross Scientific 
banking stops among other places at um, the Selvis Islands in what was then the Dutch East Indies. And you can see here that skill he was developing with the camera, um, not just documenting what he saw, but documenting it beautifully. And, um, and also um, sticking with those whales uh, on the coast of Japan, um, sometimes on the um, coast of Alaska, bringing back wow. um, new materials for the museum and uh, by literally by the crate full, which was not a, a, an in, a, a small, small and insignificant task in 1910 um, for this young man barely out of college to be um, marshalling all of this material back to the museum. And uh, he continued his explorations for a while um, on um, um, the ocean, but he had the unfortunate characteristic of being chronically seasick. And he'd had the opportunity in 1912 to do some exploration in Korea. And that really got him hooked on land exploration. Uh, he took a break in 1914 to marry Yvette Borup. And, um, um, and they enjoyed traveling together for fun, but also professionally. And by 1916, the two of them were back in, um, or were off to, to Asia on a um, more than a year's long journey through China and other um, parts of that region. Um, and Yvette was not along just as a companion. She was uh, at the official photographer. You can see hanging in the background there on the left, her portable dark room. Um, and th again, think of the logistics of this because we're not talking iPhones here, we're talking glass plate negatives uh, and viewfinder cameras. So this was um, uh, a, a very capable achievement on a, in her own right. And uh, during the First World War, Andrews got his first glimpse of Mongolia. And he said, I had found my country, the one I had been born to know and love. And uh, by 1919, he was back um, in the country making a preliminary expedition. You can see a vet there um, on horseback at the beginning, just getting a, a feel for the countryside, what it was like. Again, a vet taking photographs, uh, Andrew's there as well, and, um, and just scoping it out so that they could prepare to go back. And you'll be hearing later from uh, Dr. Novacek and Dr. Norell about the, um, the range of the um, expeditions that followed um, and that ultimately brought Andrews back to the American Museum where he became the director. And uh, he ended his life um, living in California, died in 1960 at the age of 76. And at his request, his remains were brought back to Beloit uh, where they were buried, bringing him back full circle. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the legacy of Andrews in his hometown um, and the Roy Chapman Andrews Society that was founded there in about the year 2000. And one of the keystone features of the society, one of the, the and I was a founding board member, one of the things that we've um, sustained uh, almost from the beginning was inspired by this notion that Andrews who had won so many awards um, was worthy of having an award given in his own name. And that became the Roy Chapman Andrews Society Distinguished Explorer Award, which appropriately enough was presented for the first time in 2003 to Dr. Novacek from the American Museum. And um, I'm just gonna page through the, um, the examples of the people who have received the award since, uh, many distinguished explorers, making it clear the point that we try, we're trying to make from the beginning that exploration is alive and well, and, um, and that there are um, wonderful stories to be told and shared uh, with adults and children alike. And one of the features of the award is not just bringing the explorer to the community uh, to give a lecture, although that's a, the, a key element of it, but we're also um, working to share the, um, these experiences and this knowledge with, um, with young people in the community. And so um, the explorer is, um, is not just taking home an award, but also contributing back um, to the, um, the area 
and getting to visit some of these touchstone places in the community, the Logan Museum, which was already in existence um, when Andrews was a student, his birthplace, his, his grave. Uh, and then, as I said, informal interactions with people in the community, outreach to students in the area, um, presentations in the local schools, uh, smaller seminars and so forth as a way to just convey that excitement of, of exploration and the possibility of exploration. This is a career, this is a job that, um, that we hope young people will do, um, consider doing themselves. And um, including this young boy who grew up in Beloit, climbing a tree, came back um, exploring the area, came back many years later to, to himself receive um, the Andrews Award and try to pass that spark along to the next generation of young people in the Beloit area and beyond. And so that's the legacy we've tried to foster um, in the hometown of Roy Chapman Andrews. You can find out more about the society online, just RoyChapmanAndrewsSociety.org and find out more about the award and our other outreach, become a member. We have members all around the world, including in Mongolia. And, um, and I appreciate being able to introduce you to a little bit of this, um, this history and would be happy to answer questions at, uh, later on when, um, when we get to that part. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Anne. Um, yeah, also, yeah, Beloit just has a really great museum studies program and such amazing facilities and, you know, it's another really amazing connection to Richard and Andrews. Um, so also I need to announce that unfortunately, um, Dr. Professor Tsokpatar Hishigjav was gonna be with us tonight, but unfortunately due to um, Mongolia has, is having a coronavirus, um, a, new, a new quarantine, unfortunately, and he has, been unable to be in range of the kind of connection he needs to be in. So he is not able to join us tonight, unfortunately. Um, okay, so what the next people we're gonna hear from, we are continuing to <laughs> continue with the AMNH. Um, we're gonna hear from uh, Dr. Michael Novacek and Dr. Mark Norell. Um, Dr. Novacek is the Senior Vice President and Provost of Science and the Curator for uh, and Professor of Paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Um, he's had a wide range of interests from the fossil record to data on DNA sequences. Um, he's participated in expeditions on, it looks like almost every continent, um, except maybe Antarctica, I'm not sure. Um, as well as, of course, in the Gobi Desert um, in search of dinosaur fossils and mammals. Um, and he, he has um, also published a number of popular books, including Dinosaurs of the Flaming Cliffs in 1996. Um, and he, as a provost at the MNH, he oversees a staff of 200 scientists, graduates, and postgraduate fellows and technicians who have responsibility for one of the world's largest natural history and cultural collection, collections. Um, and he and um, Dr. Mark Norell are going to be presenting together. Uh, so uh, Dr. Norell um, is a curator of paleontology since 1989 at the, also at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and he's currently chair of the Division of Paleontology. Um, he has worked on theoretical topics relating to the study of diversity through time, the efficacy of the fossil record in capt capturing phylogenetic history, and how new approaches can be used to study the paleobiology of extinct humans. And as a side project, he's looking into the evolutionary origins of cancer in humans, which is pretty interesting because as an anthropologist, I will mention that Ray Chapman Andrews, one reason he wanted to go to Central Asia, of course, is because he thought that there would be early human remains. So that's interesting. Um, uh, Dr. Norell has also um, worked across the globe um, besides Mongolia. The Mongolia project now in its 30, 30th is now in its 30th year. Um, and he's named a number of dinosaurs, including with the Mongolian names um, Tsagan and Almas. Um, he's got a long list. And um, if anyone would like to see the longer versions of these bios, please check out the event page on the Mongolia Center website. Um, I should also say that Dr. Norell has gotten. Um, 
the Narendal Medal by decree of President Elbigdorj, which is the highest honor awarded to the Mongolian government. In 2013, and also the Kublai Khan Medal by decree of the Mongolian Academy of Sciences. Okay, so I will turn it over to you two. Hey, well, I guess I'll start. That's so thank you, Marissa. And, and thank you, Anne, for that exquisite background to Roy Chapman Andrews and his roots and his coming to the museum. So I won't spend a lot of time dealing with that. Can you hear me? Is, that, am I, is my voice coming through? Great. And so uh, I'm going to really kick off where Roy virtually went to Mongolia and started those expeditions and the, the basis for those expeditions, why they occurred and, and why, you know, uh, the American Museum was so interested in, in doing that kind of work. It's kind of an interesting history actually. So that's the Gobi Desert. Can everybody see that? An enormous place, an enormous empty place, maybe the emptiest place in the world outside of Antarctica and Mongolia has fewer people per square miles than any place in, in the world. The Gobi Desert is about a million square miles of desert. Uh, it's, it's not exactly a desert. It has an enormous amount of variegation from mountain ranges with snow to lakes, to uh, sand dunes, to uh, empty valleys, to magnificent rock formations everywhere. And of course, for magnificent fossils. It's hard to beat it in terms of any place in the world. Let's see if I can get this going forward. Yes. So uh, as Anne said, Roy Chapman Andrews and the Central Asiatic Expeditions began in 1922. This has really followed a lot of work that he did in Japan and other areas in Asia. He was inspired by his zoological work. But of course, um, it's an interesting story because basically there was a lot written in the early 20th century about the fact that humans probably originated from Asia and all, all other mammals. That was not only based on Osborne's work, who was the president of the museum eventually who approved of these expeditions, but also earlier paleontologists and uh, evolutionary biologists like William Diller Matthew wrote a very famous work in 1950 that talked about the dispersion and the evolution of mammals, including humans, from Central Asia. Some people, historians have said subsequently, there was a, a racist tone to this. And it's possible Osborne has a very checkered reputation. And he was a supporter of eugenics and other things. So this was this in our, as we look back in history, this is a very complex, a very complex story. Nonetheless, Osborne approved of an expedition to be launched in Mongolia. And there you see the, fam the famous flaming cliffs with all the camels below the cliffs. Uh, Andrews was an enormously effective organizer of expeditions. Um, as a scientist, he was probably less so. He had Walter Granger, who was an extraordinary scientist along on the expeditions, who was a very important member of, of, uh, of the effort. But Andrews had a real skill in organizing things. And of course, one of the interesting things about the 1922 expeditions is, uh, and, and following through was that this, this was the first major uh, global expedition that involved uh, the use of motor cars, the Dodge motor cars that were used in the, in the expedition as well as the camels. So this is a shot below the flaming cliffs. These are some of the major characters that were discovered, the extraordinary discovery. And this, the, the story of this discovery, many of you are familiar with it, but it's quite interesting is that September 1st, the first year of the expedition, 1922, September 1st, on their way really out of the Gobi, they were lost. And they stopped at a Gur on a flat plain just north of the Gervon Saikon Mountains. And Roy and a number of people walked over to a Gur where there were some military 
people there and asked for directions. As he was doing that, the cameraman, who was a hugely skilled cinematographer, walked out of the Jeep or walked out of the Dodge motor car and started sauntering out toward the north. He saw a thin line, a thin red line at the rim of this green plane, walked over and saw a fantasy of fiery orange red cliffs. And within minutes, he started finding bone down there. And the first really dramatic uh, discovery was a partial skull of one of these protoceratops, these ceratopsian dinosaurs that are so famous for the Mongolian, for the flaming cliffs. Um, there were other bones that were found, but the irony of that first expedition is that they all left. They spent an afternoon there in September 1st, 1922, but as the weather got worse and the snow, they were worried about the snows, they, they headed back to Urga, which, you know, then Urga Ulaanbaatar uh, was the capital of, of Mongolia. Uh, among other interesting finds, when they came back in, in 1923 and started finding, oh, actually, I should say that at, uh, Shackleford actually found some fragments of eggs that looked possibly were identified as bird eggs. But in uh, 1923, it was clear that the expedition was really turning up some incredible, incredible finds, including Oviraptor. Oviraptor was uh, splayed out over a set of eggs. And so it was thought that it was actually raiding uh, Protoceratops eggs. And that's a wonderful story that sort of had its, its conclusion or came round with our expeditions in the 1990s. So, um, that was one of the great finds of the 20s expeditions by Andrews. Zalamdolestes was an example of a mammal, some very important mammal remains. And it's important to emphasize that up to this point, very ancient mammals from the time of the dinosaurs were only really known for one or two specimens. So this was a breakthrough discovery of really good specimens of ancient mammals from the age of the dinosaurs, from the Cretaceous and from earlier times. Uh, of course, Andrews left in the end of the decades of the 20s. Uh, there were five expeditions. The last expedition was in the 1930s. It was somewhat frustrating because they were constrained from really going into Mongolia and working. They spent most, most of their time in China. And, you know, I think he had aspirations to continue on there, but there was too much frustration and the expeditions ended. Politics changed everything. There were wars, there was the takeover of the Soviet Union in the satellite countries, including Mongolia, and Western scientists were essentially sealed out and they continued to be sealed out for over 60 years. Uh, but there were some, there was very important scientific work that was done during that, that interval. The Soviet expeditions in the 1940s under Yefremov explored areas to the south in the fabulous Namek Valley where Andrews really didn't have the equipment to go or the navigational prowess to, to, to explore. So uh, Efremov and his, his expeditions went into these valleys with their uh, very well-suited uh, Soviet military uh, vehicles, including things that we still use today in our expeditions, like the Gaz 66, into an area like this, like the Mech Valley, in which were replete with fantastic dinosaur specimens, including Tarbosaurus and many other things. Subsequently, and I'm just gonna make some highlights, it doesn't do justice to this history, the Polish-Mongolian expeditions from 1963 to 71. You see this uh, lady here who was the leader of these expeditions, Sofia Kielan Yavorowska, a very famous paleontologist. Sofia was actually not trained to work on vertebrate fossils. She was an expert on trilobites, but she had the opportunity politically to go to the uh, Mongolia to look for dinosaurs. And uh, she was very successful as a leader and an organizer and a scientist as well. And of course, during this 
time, there were some amazing, amazing discoveries. The fighting dinosaurs, which are world famous, an amazing situation where, you know, uh, you have Velociraptor and, and a Protoceratops locked in immortal con, uh, immortal combat. And you can see the specimens there. This is the very light matrix, rock matrix that you see around Tukukin Shire, which is an area about 50 kilometers west of the Flaming Cliffs. So there were these, these incredible discoveries that were made. Uh, we, there were also many other expeditions, the, the Russians and the Poles, but also the Mongolians carried out a number of very important expeditions all through this period and, and many important finds. And one of the tricks of history, one of the strangest events I think Mark and I have ever experienced is we were suddenly invited to come back. I mean, do we have Ronald Reagan to thank for that? Do we have Glasnost to thank for that or whatever? But the Soviet Union collapsed and uh, the Mongolians, as soon as they had the opportunity, wanted to return in their collaboration with Americans. And I was lucky enough to be the chairman of the vertebrate paleo department at the time that we received our invitations and we come back. This is a photo montage of our crew in the very early years, looking slimmer and darker. Uh, and this is probably, I think around 1991 or 92 uh, in front of a wonderful area that's Hulsan, which is west of, uh, of a site that we've been really working for many years. Uh, at that time, our Mongolian co-leader was Demerlin Dashaveg, who's standing here. I believe Dashaveg was actually the discoverer of the fighting dinosaurs, and he was also an important member of the Polish uh, Mongolian expeditions and Mongolian expeditions subsequently. A lot of his important work really dealt with early Cretaceous mammals as well. And so here are some of the localities. And I put in black there our own discovery in 1993. This is a set of badlands, about midsection of the Nemec Valley, about, uh, about 20 kilometers north of a tiny town here called Daos, which is the Mongolian word from south for, for salt. And this escarpment is not very dramatic. Actually, when you look at it, when you're, you're standing on the ground and looking to the north, but we decided to go there. Our gas tanker got stuck in the sand. We said, well, while the gas tanker, were, what they were trying to dig the gas tanker out, we would take a look at these beds up there. And we had an incredible day in July of 1993 in the discovery of the site. Clearly, no one else had been there before. And it's nothing like being in a place. There's only one thing better than being in a place uh, that you make some finds and you're, you know you're the first one to find these things. But uh, being in a place that's incredibly rich where you know, you know you're the first person to find these things. And indeed, we've done extremely well in the site. And we've spent most of our time in the subsequent years, all the way up to a total of 30 years for the Gobi expeditions, looking at these not only adults, but these exquisite fossils of tiny protoceratops. And of course, the famous specimens of uh, dromaeosaurs like Velociraptor, and Mark can talk a lot about that. A highlight was even the first year, Mark found this, this egg with the embryos uh, of an oviraptor. And what was very important about that story is it really, uh, in a sense, prevaricated the notion that these eggs were from Protoceratops. They were actually Oviraptor eggs that that, that Oviraptor, that, that egg hunter was actually lying on. So it was a, a brooding animal on its nest and many subsequent discoveries. Here's Amy Davidson, who uh, was helping us uncover one of these spectacular specimens that again was found in the first 1993, the first uh, discovery of the Uka Toga. And there we are um, pulling the, these specimens out. 
This is the nesting dinosaurs. And here in all its glory, a cast is on display at the American Museum, but the original specimen has been returned. It's in Ulaanbaatar, in the Institute of Paleontology, the museum there, or in one of the sites in, in the Ulaanbaatar where people can see these specimens. So these specimens, I want to emphasize, all belong to the Mongolian government. And uh, they are uh, they they have been returned routinely, and once we have been able to study and prepare them, it's a huge amount of work it takes to prepare and study these specimens. So uh, they have been returned, like this one and many others. Uh, there are also uh, in my area of interest. Uh, the mammals, which are extraordinary. You can see these exquisite preservation. You don't get anything like this in North America. And of course, Andrews and his crew also saw that as well. I should say that Boris Setzeg, uh, our host for this meeting, uh, is an expert in, on this group of multi-tuberculates. She actually did her dissertation, her PhD, at the American Museum of Natural History on these these exquisite animals, and there's a lot more to be discovered about them. Uh, Boulder joined us in 1996, and I, I hope she won't mind me in saying that we, uh, she was hired as a cook by the Mongolians, but her father was a well-known paleontologist, and we noticed during the expedition that she was finding huge numbers of fossils, more than many of us, and we said, well, she, I think she's going to be a paleontologist and our, our predictions were born true. Uh, there are some other very important mammal specimens that we have now, and we're currently working on some really uh, new stuff from Uka Togad of specimens. And with this amazing imagery that we can now get with CT scanning, this, has been, this is a, a scan that's been done by Ava Hoffman, one of our graduate students right now in the program at the museum. Uh, of a delta theridian, a very uh, closely marsupial-like mammal. We're getting really a lot of uh, anatomical detail that we've never had before. And there's some more, this, this, these little uh, gems of small mammals. And we've had a lot, we, we've recovered a lot of specimens from this one site. One of the most interesting issues there is why is the Mongolia so good at preserving some of these specimens? Why are these specimens so exquisitely preserved? Originally, we thought they were just buried in sand dunes because clearly the uh, units there are very sandy. They look like dunes. You can see this kind of cross bedding that suggests dunes. Here's a sand expert uh, who worked with us uh, for a couple of years during the expedition to, to to look at this problem. But it seems that, as he pointed out, none of these animals are really preserved in rocks that preserve the structure of the sand, the cross, cross bedding of the sand. They're not in migrating dunes, they're more in stabilizing dunes, and the animals have probably been preserved in uh, what we call stabilized dunes. And uh, what's the general idea is that these animals had their nests and there was a lot of congregation of different species in these cavities between the dunes. And then intermittent rainstorms really came in and collapsed the dunes and buried a lot of these animals, including the mammals and the nests and a lot of the animals that are there. It's hard to find modern analogs for this, but one, one of the situations here is um, what you see in Western Namibia where there are these lagoonal situations or marsh-like situations between these, among these enormous dunes. And that might have something to do with the preservation that you see here. So we go on, we had our 30th season in 2019. It wasn't without all its, uh, the sadness. Oh, a dear, dear friend and comrade who really kept this expedition together since about 1993 or 94, Temir uh, is shown here. And he very shockingly and unexpectedly died in, in 2019 before on the eve of our expeditions on that summer. 
and it's a huge loss, but it just we, we, it's important for us to acknowledge how much how important he was to keeping this expedition going. He was a genius of a mechanic, genius in look you know in in getting us from one place to another in the trucks. And um, he did win a recognition from the American Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, a special award for his support for paleontological efforts a few years before that. And he's just dearly missed as a friend and a companion and a really, really vital member of the team. This is a, just a, a shot, a portrait shot of our group there. You can see Mark and you can see myself there in, in the 2019 expeditions. We just bought a new Soviet truck that's in back of us. And you see uh, also in this shot uh, between Mark and myself is Han Yodan, who's been very important as a Mongolian co-leader co for all these years, for the last 10 years or so. She really succeeded in that role after Dashaveg. And she, she is a terrific scientist and she was so, so effective in working with us all these years. And Marissa, that's all I have. Great. Um, are you ready, Mark? Yeah. So, cool. I up and pulled together on my share screen, so. Got it, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's good. Great. Okay, man, this is going to be big. Like, uh, if any of you guys are sports fans and stuff, this is going to be big. Quick as two minutes and dinosaur paleontology. So, but here we go. So, Mike covered a lot of this and stuff. And, you know, I mean, I think that Roy Chapman Andrews has like, been understood and misunderstood because certainly that he is uh, looked at and kind of deified amongst pop paleontologists and stuff as a, a real person who is a uh, a paleontologist, but he was not a paleontologist at all. And he wouldn't even consider himself a paleontologist. I mean, I can remember like sitting when Charles John Gallenkamp was like doing his book about, you know, going out and visiting his like surviving wife and that, and she was wonderful, you know, and everything else to talk about all the stories, but he really couldn't do it as a paleontologist. But Certainly, like that, he's a great expedition leader, and certainly, like you know, here, you know, like here when he was like in Japan and stuff like that, he did that kind of stuff. And then, but the real person who really did all the stuff of the Separated Jacks expeditions was Walter Granger, who's standing there, you know, with his dog. And but you know, he was a wonderful collector, and you know that he like it was kind of like this, like you know, one person, one person. That you know, Granger really ran the camp for finding fossils. You know, like uh, you know, a uh, Roy like really did like the big kind of stuff of trying to get the money for everything that's going. But nevertheless, like when the, they found everything there, the flaming cliffs. This is the big deal. They found five dinosaurs. Okay, and they say like you know, like you know, flaming cliffs is the greatest place to look for dinosaurs in the entire world. But at the same time, that like uh. We can go look at the American West, other places, and everything else, and we can find tons of dinosaurs there. But that's what makes the Flaming Cliffs so interesting because it's like there's you know five things that those guys found when they were out there. So let's go through them one by one. Panacosaurus, okay, so and Kyle's star dinosaur, it's not a big dinosaur. It's like that not gigantic and. And that's one of the other things that really leads to it. So about these things, one that the the, the, the flaming cliffs in other places is because that we don't find gigantic dinosaurs that we find dinosaurs this this long. And when they found this one, they only found a little bit of it. And you know, Mike and I have found like a tails of these things, which shows is totally different. They have big like gargoyle spikes sticking out of them and everything else. But you know, and it goes to the biases of the fossil record is you don't find really little stuff and you don't find really big stuff but there's special I don't know, less than a special circumstances. So okay, like he found proceratops. That was great. And this is one of the like great specimens that they found at the flaming cliffs. And this is not the type specimen, but nevertheless it's a very important specimen because 
that it kind of speaks to how these vests were preserved because that in the old days they thought they were like you know preserved by like those you know, sand dunes uh you know, not sand dunes but you know, nevertheless like you know sandstorms covering up with flint and that, but then this, these guys you know when they found them now we can interpret them as being like very 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 covered over buried in life so the, all of a sudden this guy gets buried by a gigantic sand dune and he's sitting there holding his head and he goes, oh no, oh no, oh no. But like that's what happened to him, that he was buried by a sand dune and that the collapse on top of him. And even there's a great specimen on display at the American Museum of Natural History. And that uh, it's uh, it actually, they prepared it, they prepared it upside down because it's the, like, it was like really laying like, you know, on its stomach. And they got, we feel it was swept away by a gigantic sand dune. And stuff so it's curled up underneath itself and it's uh so all these things are what we call death specimens and it happens but so these animals like pro service is about like you know two meters long uh there's a lot of evidence from specimens that we have from the Yashi formation and stuff or Yashi area and stuff in china that show that they had not feathers but uh these big spikes in their tails and they were really the, the major carnivorous animal or uh, prey animal rather of uh, the, that time period. So like when you look at the, at you know, things today and stuff or things in the past and stuff, and you think that like, yeah, yeah, you know, the, today was the fossil record. Obviously there's, there's thousands more, you know, the, the prey animals and carnivorous animals. That's what makes the animals that like I work on so incredibly rare because uh, it's about one percent of what happens. Let's go back to our chapters and kind of pro top stuff. You know, one of the things he did is that to like Banzak, you know, Banzak, whatever you want to call flaming clothes, that it was like so good uh, when they found it. Because, and that they collected all these protoceratop specimens. These protoceratop specimens are so in, like exquisite because that. And that, that they allowed us, the, the first studies of how to study growth in dinosaurs really came from these animals because it was just a like, you know, great growth series. Well, let's move on to the eggs, okay? And the eggs, like, I mean, that you know, this is like a totally staged photograph and everything because of this nest that they have there. And, uh, you know, like I said before, like, you know, Russian has never collected a single specimen and, it was totally like you know, Granger and his guys who did it, but those specimens became incredibly iconic. And when I say this, I'm not slagging on Andrews as an expedition leader, but he was certainly like that. Uh, and they, they had some really great pillings halls there. So it's a, it's a wonderful specimen of an oviraptor nest. And and they found the oviraptor. And uh, that, that one before I showed before was the first dinosaur nest. And then this is a carnivorous dinosaur. It's one of the groups of dinosaurs that I'm very interested in. And we publish a lot in like the R-Lab and everything. And this is the original one. And it was called Oviraptor just because that they thought that it was predating on uh, Protoceratops nests, the dinosaur I was referred to before. And it is like a, that because it, this, this animal is found on top of one of those nests and that then, um, you know, but things moved on. So it wasn't a big animal, it's not a meter long. It was feathered, everything. But then, like, you know, things started to change because is that, that they thought that Oberrath was predating on this nest. And that the reason they thought it was predating on the nest because the Protoceratops is the most common dinosaur that was ever found in those sediments. So they equated then that the most common dinosaur with the most common nests. And then they like went on to, went on to say like, well, you know, you find an overactor on top of the most common nest, it must have been eating those eggs. So kind of like we had a little bit of to deal with a change. Now we found this egg in 1993. And at, when we first discovered Ucatolga, and it was the Proceratops egg. But it had a uh, a uh, uh, an overwrapped embryo on the inside of it, so we could show that then that the overwrapped was not you know 
this reconstruction of it, but we, we could show that then that the uh, overwrapper was not predating on those eggs because that was that egg inside of it. And then we found this one in 1993. And uh, that, uh, again, you know, it was like something like that. But wow, you know, this is actually like a dinosaur, inc like not incubating, but sitting on top of its eggs. And so this was the over the perceptus kind of egg with a uh, uh, an over sitting on top of it. So it was like good mother lizard and stuff. And then we found several more after that. Uh, we found four of them at this point and stuff. So these are all you know things that show that uh, the original interpretation of these things that as like being predated on by these animals and stuff was really wrong. Okay, so let's go to the weirdo stuff. Okay, this is an animal called Sornithoides and that at the Flaming Cliffs and other nematic localities that the group of dinosaurs at this point is called Troodons are incredibly rare. Right now, like, you know, that we have, like, from, just if you just look at the Flaming Cliffs at Vines are, you would say, like, okay, we got, like, a, you know, we have, like, uh, one over after we have the one troodon in it, and we have like three or four like velociraptors and of those three or four the velociraptors the stuff that mike and i have collected like uh the, the two three and four and these animals are just so rare and it's such a testament to like uh how like you know andrews was able to collect these things or not not andrews but granger rather and find these things because of the four things which are the most important within like you know like reptile world like dinosaur world and stuff you know like mike can like chime in on the mammal stuff that that you know wasp raptor okay uh there's none of them from there okay you know they they found a great one they found a really great one and then, like, we found two more, like, really good ones, and, but that's it. And then over after, only one specimen. Soren authorities, only one specimen. And so, uh, so, like, it's really, like, you know, kind of looking at it, so sitting there and going, those guys are at the right time, right time, to sort of pick up this really, like, rare fauna. And, you know, we've been, you know, me, you know, Mike, Boldra, and so I've been in Uka for a very, very long time. And that, you know, granted, it's a wonderful, wonderful fossil locality, but we're able to replicate specimens. Like we can find, you know, lots of Panacosaurus, we can find lots of this, but, you know, mine's off is a special locality and stuff because those guys were only going there like in the 20s and stuff. And they were able to find some really like, great stuff. But they're one offs, except for Lost Raptor, which is like three, but no more over Raptors, no more Sarnacoides. And so, you know, great place, you know, great time. So I just hope that uh, ongoing government and I hope that uh, Boulder, your organization and stuff, that we can finally pull it together to like kind of make this a World Heritage Site or to make it something similar as a, you know, a place that. Uh, is really treasured because uh, you know, those are really good. You know, they had a really good run there and with some great specimens. So thank you, and I'm out. Wow, thank you so much. Any questions? Is, yeah, everybody is just commenting about like how amazing these photographs are. Um, <laughs> really beautiful. Um, OK, so I think next uh, we're going to do the questions and stuff all at the end. Um, so we're going to hear next from uh, Dr. Sandar and uh, Kelly Kluwer, um, and they've done some work together on uh, photographing the and mapping um, the route of the Central Asia Expedition to um, the second Central Asia Expedition um, Centennial, so that was a few years back. Um, the upcoming Centennial will be for the third expedition. Um, so I guess I'll just, did you, did you two want to present together or did you want to go separately or? Yeah, we're going to present together, Marissa. Okay. I'll just say a couple of words then about, about both of you. Okay. 
Okay, so um, Dr. Sonder, um, I have to state, say this from his, from his biography because it's also amazing. Um, not only is he working on dinosaurs, he also, um, when he was a young engineer after getting his PhD from the um, Moscow Central Research Institute in the fields of satellite mapping and space geodesy, he um, prepared for the, helped prepare for the joint uh, Soviet-Mongolian space flight. So, you know, we have space as well as dinosaurs. It's amazing. Um, and um, he continued to do, to do work in the 80s um, in photogrammetry, aerial photography, and space remote sensing. Um, and um, in post-Soviet times, he founded the MonMap Engineering Services Company. And he has been involved more recently in nationwide GPS network, um, cooperating with the Ministry of Defense of Mongolia and other organizations. Um, and of course, as I just mentioned, he is co-leader of the Central Asia Expedition to Centennial Three Photographic Mission in Mongolia. Um, and um, Kelly Kluwer is the other co-leader of that rephotographic mission. Um, and they're gonna be speaking more about that. Um, he is a geologist with an interest in a wide range of earth sciences and has been involved in geological exploration for about 30 years with both junior and major mining companies. Um, although he's currently uh, based in Magadan, Russia, he, he previously worked with um, Sentara Gold, of course, in Mongolia. Um, so I will turn it over to you to show us some more excellent pictures and maps. Okay, I'll <laughs> share a screen here. Can you see that? No. Not yet. Marissa, I think you might need to unshare mm -hmm. your screen. Oh, um, let me see here. I am not currently sharing my screen, no. but do I maybe need to give you a permission? Yeah, you might. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry. You can try now. I bet I have allowed multiple sharing. Okay. I got it. How's that? Yeah, starting. Great. Okay, I'll just start off here. Um, uh, Sandar and I have been working on this. Uh, really, we kind of conceptualized it in, in 2012 and uh, kicked this off with our first uh, rephotography and in 2016, and we've been uh, making expeditions into the, the Gobi and, and other parts of Mongolia in 2017 and 2018. We, we've missed the last couple of years uh, this year because of the pandemic, but uh, we've still got a couple more years of, of work to do here. And, uh, you know, obviously none of this could have been possible without uh, the generous uh, uh, support of the American Museum of Natural History by sharing all these great photos with us. And uh, I'd like to thank up front the American Center for Mongolian Studies for asking us to participate in this. And, you know, one thing that uh, I find interesting is, uh, you know, and it's been said a couple of times here tonight, how effective an, of an organizer uh, Andrews was, and certainly that's the case. He uh, recognized the importance of photography and, and bringing great photos back to New York City so he could continue to raise funds with this. And he um, got James Shackelford, a Hollywood cinematographer, to take a lot of these photos. And, and he certainly took some of the, the great iconic photos, but um, you know, Walter Granger took some of the only photos that we know of at, uh, at Red Mesa, for example, uh, because Shackelford was never there. Uh, Andrew's wife, uh, Yvette, uh, she made some of the most outstanding photos of UB that, that we know about and a, and a big collection of those. So it's very fortunate that she was along and, and her skills were engaged 
then Roy himself, um, he took some amazing photos at, at Flaming Cliffs and, and we'll get to that. Uh, Sandor? Yes. Yeah. I'd like to say, first of all, to Mike and the Mark, the nation was a national study in also other people to help support us for implementing this project. And, uh, no, yes, we did. So I'd like to mention about this Mongolian counterpart of the American Museum Missions for Expeditions. That is part I'd like a little bit focus to who is helpful to Roshak Andrews in Mongolia. That is the main my extension here. This first was um, Jamian, who is director of Institute of Man Manuscripts Literature, who was really a man who connect the Mongolian government with Andrews and uh, to help them get signed agreement for scientific exploration in Mongolia. The next one was Dr. Jamsran. He's with Kate in Russia. He was one of the, the man who collected all kinds of uh, scientific document, documents, maps, and others. Then he worked with Andrews to help them how Better to organize science program in Mongolia. Then the third one person who was Batum Jaffo, he was Mongolian government representative who helped to Andrew's expedition to get some more legal issues, past permissions in order to countryside, as a protection them by Mongolian government, etc. Then finally, person number four, this is a great man to help Andrews. Help all logistics, all these uh, caravans. That is really a man who helped to all this, all possibilities, talking about Mike and Mark. That is all possible. He took him to through his caravans to Cyrus Postal Transfer Station in Central Mongolia. Then from them to Kalgan, China, a thousand kilometers. Way and uh, he did all this caravan work, the navigation support to Andrews. I think he is the one guy who needs to more attention here. But later on, we don't find any evidence about him. But we need to. Do that. That's about for you about four person who helped Andrews work in Mongolia to implement his uh, big, uh, big job, big project. Okay, please start, okay. Yeah, so we're, we're trying to uh, broaden the net of our collaboration here a bit. Um, the, the museum's been uh, the, the key uh, donor of, of photographs here. You can see Sandar uh, sorting through the archive in New York City several years ago when we made our initial selection of you know, there's hundreds of photographs, if not thousands there. And what we were really focused on was those photos that we thought could show evidence of, of landscape change and urban development change and uh, vegetation dynamics. So we, we tried to select um, those types of photos and then the museum scanned those at very high quality for us. So that's what we're, we're working with today. Um, Sandar, if you want to add a few words here. Yes, I'd like to say, just I'd like to say that shortly that there was a, a more than 600 photos from the libraries we located, then we selected about 200 high quality negatives, then we use it for our project. That really was a big job, and I worked about one or two weeks back then, and that is really. Thank you for all the support given by Mike and Mark in New York. And also, we come back to Mongolia also with the Institute the Institute of Paleontology of Mongolian Academy of Science. They help us also get some, some data, some information to start with. Then finally, I have some Roshat and Andrew Society here. Where is maybe Anne? Can she can make later on make more art? I was in the US to visit my granddaughter. She 
educated in the US and she got educated in American University. Then back, uh, about the uh, middle of April, I went to, to meet Belot, Wisconsin. And uh, I meet these people there, and, and I meet this homeland of Andrews. So I understand what is the origin of uh, Russia and Andrews. He really, outdoor man and like Mongolians, he liked to escape and uh, all uh, nature. That is the origin, I understand. Okay, thank you. So just a map to uh, orient everybody about where, where we've been working. We started off in Ulaanbaatar, chasing Yvette Andrews around the city, trying to find some of her views. I don't know why this keeps advancing on me, but uh, then we went down to Flaming Cliffs uh, the next year, and finally over to Red Mesa in 2018, where we've uh, amassed a pretty good collection of re-photos so far. There, there's two major sites that we're still uh, anxious to get to over at Sagan Noor, uh, planning for that in 2021. Um, pandemic travel conditions lifting is the assumption there. And then uh, later uh, we want to get over to Arden Ovo where there's some really amazing uh, desert landscape uh, photos from the CAE that we want to recollect. So to, to start with in the city, you know, one of the iconic images that Yvette captured, and this has been uh, published in numerous uh, books and articles, is the uh, Russia houses. Uh, and this is um, where, where the consulate was in Ulaanbaatar back in the day. And if you go there today, that building amazingly still exists. Yeah. It's, it's a European restaurant now, yes. surrounded by high rise apartments and the wrestling palace off to the left there. But uh, that building is still there and it's kind of amazing to me that, uh, you know, it begs the question, why is this thing still here in, in a city like Ulaanbaatar, which is just growing like crazy? But there it is. Over at uh, Red Mesa, like I mentioned, uh, Walter Granger was kind of the key photographer here. Uh, he must have uh, had the camera that week, I guess. But he also made uh, some very iconic images in this uh, camp of the Red Mesa has appeared in numerous publications. And Sandar and I found a, a local guide that knew how to get us into Red Mesa. But uh, it seemed like we drove around this place three or four times before we actually could orient ourselves and figure out where in the heck this camp was that Granger photographed. But we finally did find it. And uh, that's what it looks like today with a slightly different vehicle sitting on it. And, uh, yeah, we found this. So the, the importance of doing this is, is we can see some uh, subtle evidence of landscape change here. And we're also collecting precision GPS coordinates on the camera location so that anybody in the future can go right out there and recollect these photographs or you know these days you can even program a drone to go collect this photograph for you now that we know the exact location of the, the camera and then uh, just back to flaming cliffs so uh, we, we've seen this photo in, in mike's uh, presentation uh, this is really a great photo this uh shows marin leading the 125 camel logistics operation here and kind of an interesting story with the the dodge vehicles um yeah they use the dodge vehicles but how did they get fuel for those things well this is how they got fuel for the dodge vehicles they they staged fuel at various uh, locations along the route with a camel train and uh, this was an interesting place to try to re-photograph because we actually had a devil of a time finding it because those two big towers in the left of center of the image are no longer there. It looks like this today. So those towers have collapsed since Shackelford took that photo in 1925. So this was kind of a, an early uh, indication to us that, wow, you know, with reef photography, we can see some big geomorphological changes happening down here. We can see the cliff face 
at flaming cliffs retreating. So just a kind of a before and after, this is a, what the place looks like. And then as I mentioned, uh, Roy Chapman Andrews um, took some interesting photos here. They're, they're always kind of askewed and tilted and, and look kind of funny. But uh, one thing he did was he got up close and personal with the cliff face and took detailed photos of it. And so today we can re-photograph these and, and see boulders creeping down the slope, see these massive sandstone columns collapsing. And we can see a lot of change that it's possible because of the, the particular style of photography that Andrews employed here. So just another one, he, he seemed to be fascinating with, with these two features. Uh, Sander and I have called them the Twin Towers, uh, maybe for obvious reasons to most Americans because they've come down in the meantime. But yeah, this is what, what it looks like today and, and 100 years ago. And uh, he really did get up into the cliff face. We, we had trouble finding this location because it probably doesn't really exist anymore. I think it's kind of collapsed away, but we got as close as we could. And you can see a lot of uh, changes. Look at that uh, big pendant in the uh, center of the photo here big triangular feature at the cliff face. It's pretty much only half there now. So this is the kind of thing that you can see when you re-photograph Andrew's cliff face images. Sandor, I'll turn it over to you here. Yes, okay. But uh, during our first visit to Alarming Beliefs, we made uh, some mapping work, including drone surveying. And uh, that is the area we are uh, was working on this drone data is about yes, 0.3 square kilometer area. As you can see now in this area. And uh, this is by a uh, yellow lens. In that area, we collected very high resolution drone data. And uh, then we processed them, we generated a uh, uh, digital tourist model. And uh, that is a uh, high resolution data, very useful for those, uh, mapping or uh, studies over this uh, climbing leaf areas. To make 3D model and uh, to have uh, uh, modeling and all the kind of issues. But it's still we not yet started all this processing, but it's possible to, to use, I think, for special and, uh, and field studies in there. And uh, then also this area is mapped by satellite mapping. You see this satellite image. We will be later on, we will have more detailed mapping work around here, but we will discuss them now with Dr. Butter and the Academy of Science to do some, some more work here. Okay, next. Yeah, this is about a digital surface model of flying glyphs. You can see all rotating and uh, you can see above and the outside and the, from the back side. Yeah, that is area where is a uh, uh, collapse of or the still going on this collapse and landslide sliding down and uh, it's all it's all that is very high resolution about you have about three centimeter resolution on the ground. Then later on, we like to classify by by colors to make uh, the classification of kind of rocks and uh, surface areas. But this is the next next uh, stage of our work, and we still look into that. I think I, I hand over some uh, package for uh, Mike and uh, Mark. Two years ago, I think and, uh, you have some original data, some table data for Flanders. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is particularly interesting technology because with with drones and the uh, resolution that they can capture, uh, this is probably the ideal way really to do re photography in the future. And you know, this could be done on an annual basis. You, you fly the drone around the cliff face for a couple of days, collect this data, 
and you'll be able to actually measure what's going on at the cliff face, where is it changing rapidly, and you know, where are potential safety issues given the fact that there's tourists wandering around here. But certainly because, there are places in but yeah. certainly there are places in Mongolia there's no tourists which could capture the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once we found out that these things were, were coming down, we thought, well, we we better measure this and see what's going on here. And you know, one of the best photographs that really illustrates this is a Shackleford image, which um, was certainly staged also, showing the, the Dodge car down there at the base. Uh, this is supposedly where they found the uh, egg nest and uh, could well have been for all I know. But anyway, when we reoccupied this site, uh, now this is what we saw. So that big uh, column on the cliff face, uh, just completely right. missing. So it, the next year we uh, got clever and uh, came out here with our, our uh, driver and chief technician that uh, is holding a, a one meter scale board here at the cliff face so we can uh, measure this from almost the same view. And we'll just zoom in on this, this area here in the next couple of slides. So in the Shackleford image, you can see the, the prism there on the left hand side. Uh -huh. And here's what it looks like today. Yeah. Huh? So a good five meters by about 20 meters of rock has just disappeared off this cliff face. Right. And, and I think it happens pretty rapidly because, uh, you know, it's not grain by grain uh, wearing the, the cliff yeah. away. This thing has fallen away because we can still see what's what's left of one of these on the other side of the cliff there. That's cool. So, right. Uh, and, you know, it was interesting, too, uh, going through some of uh, Mark Norell's publications. He, he had a photo, Mark, in one of your 1995 books that showed a similar view of flaming, flaming cliffs. And this column has collapsed there already. So we know what right. happened before your photo yeah. in 95. So right. it'd right. be interesting to find out when exactly. Like, maybe some local people down there actually know when this happened. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they might. I'm sure they might. Yeah. So in terms of uh, planning for uh, next year, uh, you know, we're, we're getting a little smarter uh, as each year goes by. Um, we really want to get this shot that Shackleford took um, out to the west because it shows some interesting vegetation. And we're using Google Earth to uh, try to figure out, you know, basically where was his camera location. And it works very well in right. this instance because you can see basically that land feature in the Google Earth 3D view. We can capture the uh, the coordinate of the viewpoint and uh, we don't have to waste any time. We can we can drive right out there and quickly obtain this site and, and take a photo on it. I'm really looking forward to doing that because it's an interesting grove of trees on this uh, alluvial uh, bench here and I, I really want to see what it looks like today. So that's kind of uh, what we're aiming for in 2021. And just to wrap up, um, you know, Andrew's uh, certainly left an enduring legacy of scientific exploration in Mongolia. I don't think there's really any doubt about that. The, the important ties he established with the uh, Mongolian government and science community is continuing to strengthen as we've heard from previous speakers. And, you know, his foresight to engage professional photographers has left behind a, a rich and unique archive, the American Museum of Natural History. You know, there's lots of old photos from the Gobi from the Russian and Mongolian and other expeditions, but as far as I know, there's really not a single unified body of work that's as rich as what was left behind by the Synthetic Expedition. So it's a really unique collection of photos. And to me, it, it, it's an ideal ground zero for these uh, landscape evolution studies, you know, particularly as uh, Flaming Cliffs uh, works towards a World Heritage Site. Um, the stability of this cliff face is, is going to become a, an important question. This is one way to get answers to that.
tracking uh, vegetation dynamics and other climate change effects. Reef photography is a great tool to do that. And we showed you an example of documenting the urban development patterns. And you probably don't need reef photography to tell you what's going on there, but you can make some interesting historical studies for sure. And, uh, you know, it's worth pointing out that at the time, the CAE was the largest uh, investment in land-based exploration for its time. That there was never up to its time anything quite like it. Andrews believed that it would result in many new discoveries. And as we've seen tonight, he was right about that. And even a century later, the legacy of discovery continues. So I, I think that the, it's a clear lesson that we should take to heart. The new investment in scientific exploration is certainly going to keep this legacy alive for future generations. And that's really what we need. Well, Sandar, if you want to add something, uh, that's basically our last slide. Yeah, basically, I also yeah, I think that Paul yes, he said that and uh, really looking to have a depending uh, COVID 19 situation, but really would like to have. More work with the closer closely, I think we'll get some good results when it's coming uh, 100 years anniversary in 2022. Thank you again. Yes. Great. Um, thank you both very much. Um, yeah, so um, did, did anyone have any? any if anyone had any questions and they were just waiting until all the presentations were finished to put them in the chat, please go ahead and do so. Um, in the meantime, um, I thought maybe a good thing to ask of the entire panel would be, um, so there are, are these photographs and it sounds like they are in different institutions that you are all affiliated with. If you could maybe summarize for everyone kind of like, where, where are these photographs? Um, that also reminds me that um, Anne and I had corresponded a couple of years ago because um, Ray Chapman Andrews' home in Monterey, California, which is pretty close to where I live now, um, there was an auction a few years ago and some of the things appeared online. So we had actually been trying to figure out a little bit more about those items. But so I was thinking about that as well. But yeah, so basically like kind of in summary, like where are these historical photos that um, the expeditions collected? Well, most of the, all of the ones that Sandar and I have been working with are at the museum in, in New York City. Uh, I think that's probably the major repository, although there's other photographs around, but uh, that's the big collection. Yeah, I think it's important that Shackleford was hired for those expeditions as well. And, and, and of course, Andrews and his wife were all dedicated and skilled photographers, but they, you know, Shackleford was a Hollywood cinematographer, or photographer, and he was hugely professionally skilled. So not only the photos that uh, Kelly and Sandra have shown, but the film footage is spectacular. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And it's hard to find the quality that you see in some of those early films, and the, the early footage that you have there. And that's in our, our vault, so to speak, is at the American Museum, but we have been very forthcoming in sharing as much material as we can. We had a request from uh, the center as well to uh, the Mongolian Center, for, uh, this, the American Center for Mongolian Studies for their library, and, and I responded positively to that. We will also provide uh, the archival material we have. We're very proud of that material. And, uh, you know, so, but it, it, a, a lot of the, a lot of the photos are there, but not all of them. There are many others that are, as you said, in other places. Fascinating, fascinating pictures and fascinating pictures never seen before. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so did you say that there wasn't a film there and somewhere in Hollywood? about the Andrews expedition to Mongolia. Could, could you tell where we could find that? No, no, not exactly. What, what happened is Shackelford was a Hollywood cinematographer or photographer, and he was hired 
for the expedition. There's an interesting story there though. Uh, when I first came to the museum in the 1980s, uh, a major Hollywood film company was interested in doing a dramatic movie about Roy Chapman Andrews. And they bought the exclusive rights to use the film footage for a period of three years. And I wasn't involved in that decision, but the museum for the money allowed them to have their rights to use the footage to make a movie about Roy Chapman Andrews. And uh, there were a variety of people who were involved, including some of the people that <laughs> actually were uh, involved in, in the Star Trek series, the Star Trek movies. But the, the uh, production or the promotion or the development of the script and the story actually lapsed. So their exclusive use of the footage lapsed as well. And it became more, we, 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 we got that back and we've more, been more freely sharing it with various people and various groups. But we're, there's not a, at, at the moment, there's not a, a, a dramatic Hollywood movie based on Roy Trapp and Andrews that's in development as far as I know. Great, yeah, and someone had just asked about um, uh, uh, things that have been digitized that would be available online and Anne just shared a link there to how to find some of those on the AMNH website. So thank you very much. Yes, yes, absolutely, we have that. That was actually one of the things I enjoyed getting ready for this presentation was discovering all those digitized images. When I did my book back in um, the late 90s, early 2000, I went through all of the, um, the files at the American Museum. It's wonderful to see them so accessible to anybody around the world. It's a, it's a, it's a huge undertaking because there were literally thousands of images and um, it, it's fantastic to see them up online. Great. Yes, someone in the chat just commented, Clive Coy, I believe he's quite correct. Unfortunately, some of the film footage was lost, just like in many other places where the old film stock and the nitrate type. But we recovered and with major projects, we recovered as much as we could and saved as much as we could. Unfortunately, you know, that's a fair amount of material that's saved. Great. Yeah, there's another really good uh, couple of questions that I think go together. So, um, what are some, some uh, paleontological questions, really interesting scientific questions that you would like to see enjoyed, or sorry, you would like to see explored and enjoyed um, in the future? So what are some, some you know, coming up, uh, maybe what's the next chapter of the story of Mongolian paleontology? Um, and also, um, what are, how, how can Mongolian paleontologists be, be supported in those efforts? Yeah. Um, Mark just gave a talk about some of the major issues at the museum about some of the major issues in paleontology uh, that are left. And one of the really interesting things about Mongolia is it has such a rich fossil history, a fossil record, but it has its gaps. And one of our goals was to try to see if we could find the extinction event there. The, the dinosaur extinction event. It's only well preserved in the world in Western North America, in the Rocky Mountain regions, Montana, Alberta, Colorado, et cetera. Where so that would be actually, like the, the, K, the, K, the boundary? The KT, the, K, okay. the KPG boundary, you know, the Cretaceous. So yeah, where the iridium, where, and where the dinosaurs, the non-avian dinosaurs, you know, disappeared, the mammals took over, all that dramatic stuff. We haven't found it. <laughs> there seems to be a gap in the record, you know, and uh, that's frustrating. And indeed, this is the case in many parts of the world, you know. We, we just haven't found that continuity of the record. Mark could probably comment on that as well. 
Hmm. Looks like unfortunately he just he just dropped off. So we're looking to see if he comes yeah. back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what, what about others? Well, and also, I mean, just the the fossils themselves. There's so much we've discovered, and actually, there's so much we discover uh, about these fossils once they're back in the lab that we weren't aware of before. We just finished a paper on some really interesting aspects of early mammal evolution that we're submitting for, for publication as we speak, actually. And Mark has got all kinds of projects going on, dinosaur reproduction, on growth and development. And of course, Mongolian, you know, you asked the question about Mongolian, development of Mongolian paleontology, and that is a huge, huge, a desire for us, you know, Dr. Boritsetsek, of course, is a, is a model for that, that kind of role. And, but as she herself recognizes, there are not enough other people who have been trained. There are groups in the, in the uh, Institute of Paleontology uh, with Sok Bhattar and his son and, and, and um, Bad, uh, Badma and others who are, you know, trained paleontologists, but it, developing whole generation of Mongolian paleontologists is a is a is a goal, and it's a challenge to try to to do that. And we're very interested in investing in the future of Mongolian paleontology. Yeah, well, I think it's really important question, especially we have a very rich fossil heritage. Um, unfortunately, not enough uh, people working on. I mean, uh, the issue is uh, in terms of general public has limited knowledge about this discovery has been happened even 100 years ago. And there's a multiple international expeditions been working um, in Mongolia. Um, so most of the cases because we have a limited capacity and in terms of having research lab and collection space and museums, those are limited. And then most of fossils has to you know, leave the country to be studied in the international museums, um, in the International Research Institute, um, including American Museum of Natural History. Um, so, so it's very challenging that we really need to do a lot of um, activities in outreach, educational um, outreach and awareness of our of the heritage in Mongolia. So to do that, I actually myself uh, founded an uh, Institute for the Study of Mongolian Dinosaurs uh, to support next generation of Mongolian paleontologists so we're working very closely with local communities in the Gobi Desert, the areas where fossils have been found. And so most of kids are actually not aware of these discoveries. So uh, 2013, actually, m &H, um, has donated us a movable dinosaur museum. So we've been traveling all across the country, uh, educating uh, kids in public about dinosaurs. So now, you know, things are changing. So we work with middle and high school students and, you know, exciting, you know, it, you know, encouraging them to interest in science and paleontology. So we have now some number of those uh, kids uh, um, wanted to be paleontologists. So I think it's a bright future, of course, but we have to do more. So having a museum would make a difference. We don't, you know, we don't even have now, Dinosaur Museum in Mongolia we used to have it, but it's closed now. I have a question. Mm -hmm. the, um, Michael, you mentioned about Mongolian Polish society in 1920s that were very influential in those kind of expeditions. And I, I'm interested in that. So, that how come that the Polish Mongolian society was very uh, kind of interested in, in those expeditions and how did they get involved in, um, and then uh, there are so many Polish societies everywhere, but the American Polish, uh, Amer which Mongolian uh, Polish society were 
very interested in that. I'm muted. Uh, yeah, it was it was actually the in starting in the 1960s, the Polish Mongolian expeditions. Okay. They were influenced by I think they were really influenced by the Russian expedition, not only Andrews, but the Russian expeditions. I think it's important to emphasize that in the paleontology world, the goal after Andrew's uh, discoveries was kind of like the nirvana of paleontology. I mean, every country, every paleontologist all over the world wanted to work if they ever had the chance, wanted to work in Mongolia. And there were very prominent Polish paleontologists who had that desire as well. They just happened to have also better inroad, a more effective inroad to working in Mongolia because, uh, because of their, their, uh, you know, their connection with the Soviet Union. And so in a sense, they inherited that access to the Soviet Union. I also think that there were Mongolian scientists who were very impressed with the Polish, with a lot of the Polish work that was being done and followed by pal Polish paleontologists. And they were indeed a very, very effective uh, group of people and expeditions that made extremely good discoveries. They published a lot. It was a, a real success over the years that they held that expedition. But I, I, I think what's really important is if we had had access to Mongolia in 1960, we would definitely look up gone there too. I mean, everyone knew that it was one of the centers in the world for great discoveries in, in paleontology. So they, they, they got in there and they did a great job following the Russians and the Mongolian scientists. Which makes me think that the Russians might have a lot of the data in the pictures and <laughs> a lot of the things before that. Do you they think might, yeah. Any, any evidence or any kind of resources in Russia? <laughs> I, I don't, I really don't know. You know, I, I don't know, so. So there is a there is a book and I have a copy because I bought it from someone in front of the central post office in 2016. That is a complete catalog of all of like the geological papers between I guess like the 1950s and 1991. And it's interesting because everything is in, in Russian except for the abstracts for the work by the Polish Mongolian expeditions, which are in right. Polish or it, yeah. actually I think a couple of them are even in English. They're in English. Um, and some yeah. of the papers are in English, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I think that one of the reasons the Polish expeditions also were very successful is they they did publish they did publish many of their uh, papers in not only Polish or Russian but also in English. So it was really. Yeah, and I mean, at that time, too, Kelly might know a bit about this as well, but um, there were geo like mining geology expeditions as well with um, with uh, the East Germans, uh, the Bulgarians, and the Czechoslovak uh, court like joint teams for geological exploration for minerals in, I guess, from the 70s, sort of the 70s, at least as well, and later, later as well. So there are certainly other sorts of not just strictly Soviet Mongolian geological work that was happening. Yeah, that's absolutely right. In fact, I followed very closely the East German expeditionary work because the gold, they, yes, Mach. they were the guys that discovered the Boro gold deposit. So we we simply built upon the work that they put in place there. Yep. But it is interesting, though. Um, you know, in that vein, if uh, you know, as an American exploration geologist, I, I thoroughly read through all of the, the Central Asiatic expedition volumes. And uh, if you uh, read them closely, uh, you'll see that they state in numerous places that in all their travels throughout the Gobi, not a single bit of evidence for a mineral deposit was seen by them. 
but in fact, they, they drove almost right over the top of OU Togoi. You know, they were cruising around world-class copper porphyry country. So there's an interesting conundrum there that I haven't quite gotten to the bottom of yet. <laughs> we're we're getting, uh, getting off the top of the, of the panel, but I mean, I think partly it would be that they were looking, they had discovered large porphyry deposits in like Chita in the north northeast of Mongolia. So maybe... Maybe they weren't looking so hard, or maybe they were right. keeping it secret, know. or I don't know either. But I agree, it's very really interesting. I think um, it's very strange that you had, you know, the half a dozen dodges full of American top geologists, and nobody saw any evidence for mineralization. Yeah, and it's called it's called Turquoise Mountain too, so it's interesting. Um, anyway, so someone notes uh, Philip Curie. Thanks for noting in the chat that there are still Russian expeditions. Uh, joint Russian Mongolian expeditions happening in Mongolia. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and someone has asked um, about uh, paleontological tourism. And I think that that kind of came up a little bit in some of the presentations. So I don't know if you would like to say more, anyone would like to say more about that. Well, I think uh, in terms of uh, you know, um, the tourism sense, uh, there are some um, tours happens uh, with different tourist companies in Mongolia. And I think, um, I'm not going to say the name of, you know, companies here to promote, but uh, I know almost like every tour companies have a tour going to Fleming Cliffs. And so um, that's pretty common. And I think, um, you know, in terms of uh, what is economical benefit and then tourism is the thing that we think would be uh, beneficial for Mongolia to give, you know, paleontological knowledge and discoveries um, to tourists. And the most importantly that uh, we you know, need to give the knowledge and um, uh, information to local communities because local communities can benefit uh, from these, you know, tours. Um, so currently what happens is most of tour companies actually come from the city. Um, so in local uh, small towns and communities really not, you know, getting enough benefit of it. So I think that's, um, you know, if we could make it a little bit better way that how communities can benefit from this, then it will be um, in a way that uh, we can help out, you know, like me, myself, I actually work with uh, with my team from the Dinosaur Institute that we work with communities, give them, you know, some knowledge about paleontology and dinosaurs and new discoveries that's been happening in their own areas. And then they can actually share that story themselves with tourists and they can be become local guide. Um, so that, you know, there is some positive thing that can happen uh, through tourism. So we do encourage that. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, um, someone brought up that like mimicked was actually, it's actually a much richer fossil site, but it's also more remote and difficult to get to. Um, and the flaming cliffs in Bayanzog are also like pretty hard to get to really, even though they are, of course, yes, on that kind of grand circuit of Mongolia that so many tourist companies do. Um, is there currently tourism to Nemec or is it something that you all think should happen or how should it happen? No, there are tourists coming to Nemec too. It's farther, but, and now the flaming cliffs is, at least with the last few years, I mean, it's much more accessible because there's a paved road down there. So there's a paved road to Dalanzadgad. So then, then you know, a dirt, a good dirt road to Flaming Cliffs. That that's fairly automatic, and the road is extending south. So you know, what used to take us three days to get to our site in the Nemec Valley, or three and a half days. Now you could, I, in 2019, we did it in one day. It was a long day, but we did, we did, 
left Ulaanbaatar early in the morning, drove the paved road, and it only got bad once we hit the Nemec Valley. So, and I know Boulder is very familiar with this. Boulder is very familiar with what's the changes in terms of transportation around there. Yeah, well, I think tour companies do have, um, you know, go to visit around Nimic areas and Lemon Cliffs. Uh, but I think uh, in terms of tourism, another thing we have to, you know, think about it is how we can really do it, um, you know, without really going into areas that, that where active research is going on. Right. So that's the challenging part of it that, you know, um, like fossils being stolen, being sold in major auction houses. So that's uh, one of the projects that I involved that bringing repatriation of uh, Mongolian dinosaurs from, from the States. Uh, successfully, we've been doing last seven years, but then, you know, that's the kind of, uh, you know, negative effect of, um, uh, too much information in all that, you know, people see, yeah. um, you know, go out to dig out and illegally start to selling like from dinosaur eggs, even in size of, you know, Turbosaurus potar, which is cousin of T-Rex being, you know, almost sold here in New York City. So I think the tourism and also fossil uh, resource management has to be very, um, uh, you know, we need really need to have a like a policy and things that government really need to work closely on this, uh, how we can, you know, make things fair to everyone, um, at the same time not having all these um, negative effects on fossils and for science. Okay, let's see. Yeah, I well, see. Uh, I think I think we're about at our our two hour mark. So, if we want to give anyone else who's waiting to ask any questions, let us know. There was one one question that I think could be a quick a quick one. Um, someone had asked, uh, "Is there like sort of a world ranking of of which, of countries by how many how many fossils they have?" Um, and where does Mongolia rank on that? I get asked that question constantly. And the answer is like, which one of your children do you love the best? I think. <laughs> <laughs> there are different ideas. Mongolia, I would say, well, I'll just give my personal opinion and it's not meant to be anything that's, you know, rings true to, to a general sense of the world, but uh, Mongolia has a special quality in the exquisite uh, nature of the preservation of these fossils. As Mark and I showed in some of those images, you just don't see that kind of detail and that kind of uh, exquisite kind of preservation in, uh, in many other places of the world. Of course, Liaoning in China does preserve dinosaurs with feathers and that's very spectacular. But another aspect of those sites in China is that the, 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 the fossils are flat, so they don't show the three-dimensionality that you have in, in, Mongolian, in the Mongolian remains. When we had an exhibit maybe 10 years ago on Mongolian dinosaurs and mammals from the Gobi sites, including Uka Togat, a lot of people didn't think they were fossils. They were so beautifully preserved. They look like bones, white bones and red rock that, you know, the preservation was so great. But I mean, Boulder can give her expert sense of all this, but I think I would say, if you were gonna be fair about it, Mongolia, Western North America, and perhaps Argentina, are three of the great dinosaur centers of the world, but they're strong for different reasons. You know, uh, Western North America for the tonnage of dinosaurs, of big dinosaurs in rock. 
Argentina for a spectacular diverse fauna of dinosaurs and mammals and other fossils and Mongolia for its own incredibly exquisite uh, thing. The other thing to remember is that places like North America were, were collected thoroughly in the 1800s. There's still a lot to find in Mongolia, you know, a lot of places that just haven't been explored. I don't know. What do you think, Bolga? I don't know. I, I mean, I agree with you, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of Mongolia, um, you know, fossils, especially when we're talking about dinosaurs, it, you know, specifically in very, um, you know, uh, specific Cretaceous, late, late Cretaceous area, which is about, what, 19 million years, mm -hmm. those, you know, areas. Mongolia has a really um, diverse kind of different kinds of dinosaur, uh, you know, fossils been uh, been known and um, and also uh, preservation is quite unique. You know, finding just the one, you know, bone of a dinosaur compared to like whole skeleton in terms of data and information to learn about that specific animal be enormous. You know, for science that you can. A lot of information, so that's basically what is Mongolian fossils being, you know, preserved really well, and it, it helps to address important questions in the science. Um, so, for that sense, probably yes, the Mongolia, China, you know, Argentina has a lot of very important fossils, and so yeah, in terms of future, yes, we, I'm, um, yeah, positive. There's many more, you know, fossils and will be discovered, not just for dinosaurs, we have all, uh, all different kinds of fossils been known, you know, you know from invertebrates uh, coming from, you know, Cambrian, like four, 500, you know, many years mm -hmm. coming to, you know, mm -hmm. today. I mean, like, yeah. um, so yeah, there's a lot of discoveries right. been waiting to happen. Right. Yeah, so the person is following up with an earlier element of their of the question was about China versus Mongolia. Um, and I think they're they're probably referring to, you know, there are these sort of National Geographic, amazing, colorful illustrations of, of the feathered dinosaurs. And I've noticed in recent years, some of them actually have Mongolian language names. Um, are the are those sort of related to some fossils being found in Mongolia, or is it like completely different? Different um, different formations; these fossils are being found in, in different species. Or how how do those compare? Yeah, well, uh, Mark could really answer this well because he's uh, he he he's actually published a number of papers on the on the Liaoning fossils, the Chinese fossils. Uh, we have not found those kind of dinosaurs in those kind of deposits. There are Cretaceous deposits that are somewhat likely in name in, you know, in the shales and the slates, I mean, the shales that are preserved, uh, but they do preserve insects and fish and other things. But we have not found that kind of Liaoning-like preservation. It's quite possible Mongolia in certain areas does have that kind of uh, almost like a lake environment, uh, a lager, what's called lagerstraten, that, you know, sort of sediments that are set down in shallow lakes that are really good for preserving these animals when they, their carcasses gently fall to the bottom of the lake and then they're buried by a, a thin filament of sediment. Uh, and there are major sites in Mongolia that preserve that kind of rock. And we've We've chopped into those rocks on occasion. I'm sure other expeditions have as well, but we've never found anything like the Leonine uh, kinds of deposits. Okay, one one final question, I think, and then I think we're we're probably ready to wrap up um, about mammals. I think that there were a lot of 
a lot, a lot, of, quite a lot about mammals in your presentations. But someone's just asking me if there's still many fossil mammals being found, and what are some recent discoveries? Yeah, there are a lot. <laughs> so um, that's where we're, con you know, we we can really show the spectacular contrast to North America in from the age of the dinosaurs, from the Cretaceous and the Jurassic and other places. Uh, there are many specimens of mammals that are known from North America, and they're very important for looking at the early relationships of mammals. But most of these are just teeth, isolated teeth and jaws. We like to call them spare parts. They're very important for diagnosis. There are a few skeletons or a few skulls of these mammals from the age of the dinosaurs in North America, maybe three or four or five, maybe. There are hundreds of skulls of Cretaceous mammals from the Gobi. So the, the extraordinary richness is, is clearly, you know, so much more spectacular. Why that is, it's hard to say, but there's, it's, it's an enormous, and there's still a lot that has to be worked on. You know. Just some of the taxa that Boldre has worked on are represented by hundreds of specimens. They're beautiful skulls and skeletons and so forth. Yes, well, maybe Dr. Minjin, Minjin can uh, give us a full presentation about the, the mammals at some point. I'd be very interested as well. Um, so I think with that, we're going to wrap up. Um, and thanks, thanks to everyone on the panel for such an amazing breadth of different disciplines and topics um, and such an interesting overall topic as well.